welcome to the It's Time to Sell podcast with your host, Chris Spurvey. Chris is dedicated to mentoring entrepreneurs and sales professionals through the fear of selling so they can confidently bring their product or service to market. Here's your host, Chris Spurvey. Steven, welcome to the It's Time to Sell podcast. I'm grateful for your time. Hey, Chris, a real pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, it's great to talk to somebody on the other side of the world, I'm pretty sure. I'm in Newfoundland, Canada. You're, is it Australia? Yeah, I'm in uh, Sydney, Australia. I live on the northern beaches. Awesome. So, uh, a beautiful part of the world. As yeah. I believe where you are is very beautiful too. Yeah, well, no doubt. Uh, a very, uh, uh, you know, Newfoundland has its Irish roots, uh, so it's uh, very uh, green and hilly. And uh, uh, no, no, I wouldn't consider our beaches in the same line as yours, but it sounds. Like <laughs> <laughs> our, our beaches no, we're pretty are lucky in that respect. Yeah, yep. yeah exactly. Yeah. So uh, fill us in on uh, who you were. I'm. I'm. I'd love for you to just tell people. You know, what brings you to uh, this day in 2019 talking to me on a podcast? Uh, Fill us in on that. Yeah, I I had a a long career in the tech industry. Um, I was was the first salesperson for Dell in Australia. Wow. So uh, that was back in uh, 1993. And and Australia was the first operation in Asia-Pacific. So uh, I I grew with Dell over 13 years from starting up over here when actually we weren't even that big in the U S or elsewhere Right. um, from nothing to, you know, um, a large multi multi multi-billion dollar business in the Asia Pacific. And uh, I worked in a lot of roles um, across the region in different countries, you know, senior sales roles, general management, MD, you know, head of marketing for Asia Pacific. You know, they did a, a lot of different roles. Uh, you know, set up the business in India, set up the business in, uh, helped set up the business in China, was uh, the president of the Korean business for a few years. So got a lot of wide experience there. Um, then I came back to Australia and I was working in like the startup VC sort of uh, field. So worked with a couple of companies there. Um, then I had nine years in Hong Kong running the Targus business. It's a Targus, an American company uh, yeah. that's in, in the tech industry. Uh, ran that business across Asia Pacific for nine years and came back to Australia two years ago and was trying to think of a way to uh, not go back into corporate. And uh, could I find a niche, you know, helping, helping folks in roles that I used to be in? Mm. And, um, you know, it, if I look back at my career, you know, definitely had a, a lot of different successes and highlights and president's clubs and, you know, different achievements. But the thing that most I'm most proud of or what got me most excited was helping other people be successful and helping grow leaders and helping folks, you know, build and drive their businesses. So um, that's what I settled on as uh, something I could do outside of corporate. And uh, that's what I'm focused on now. Yeah, and so how many years have you been uh, uh, running this path? Yeah, it's uh, two years now, okay. and probably the first the first six months I was flapping around a bit. I was <laughs> uh, I, I actually went sort of a bit broad, if you like, with my offering. Yes, and it wasn't until about eighteen months ago I thought, okay, I've really got to you know focus in and, and present myself, um, you know, as a, a PhD in sales. Yeah, and modern sales practices. Um, I love it. Even though I've got a few other strings to my bow, but I, I've really doubled down on this. Uh, you know, put a lot of research in. Uh, you know, wrote the book, and uh, yeah, it's, it's going going really great now. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's amazing to talk to somebody. Uh, sounds like we are kindred spirits to some extent, going down similar paths uh, in different parts of the world. So that's fantastic. It- yeah, it sounds like it. You're a couple of years in as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, a couple of years into this being my uh, kind of full-time endeavor uh, uh, passion project, right? I mean, I should say it started as a passion project while working with KPMG, 
uh, with a vision to maybe someday it would uh, have enough fuel and legs behind it uh, to be able to jump out and do it full time. And I did that in the summer of 17. So it's two years this coming summer. Yes. Uh, yeah. Amazing. And uh, yeah, so fill us in on the book because I, uh, uh, I woke up early this morning and I said, God, I'm talking to this guy at nine o'clock my time. Uh, I, look, I, I can't wait. Uh, so I read through your bio and I, uh, the, the title of your book and the, and the reasoning behind the book really caught my attention again. Yes. So uh, w when I look around, um, you know, a lot's changed in the world of selling. Yes. Uh, lots change with with how buyers buy, and we can go into some of those details. Um, but I really don't see senior executives, CEOs, founders, uh, even say senior sales leaders in large organisations, really paying enough attention to this. Mm. And I didn't see enough discussion uh, on these issues, and I, I didn't see a guide for these folks on what they need to be doing to modernise their sales force and bring it up to speed. Right. And uh, it, it, I saw hundreds of books out there on sales tactics, if, if you like, how to prospect, how to run a meeting, uh, how to manage gatekeepers, you know, all these uh, very standard things, very valuable skills at, mm -hmm. for the sales level. But where was the strategy? Where was the strategy thought? And uh, I really feel sales has been a bit neglected by, by senior leadership in the last 10 to 20 years, if you like. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I thought we, we need to put a, you know, a, a microscope on it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And the title of your book is, maybe fill people in on that so, so we hear it in the, sure. the podcast. Yeah, it's called a Future Proof Sales Strategy. Yeah. And the subtitle is Seven Steps to Rise Above the Chaos, Transform Your Team, and Take Charge of Your Career. Awesome. And, and what's the, your website, just so people can go to it while listening? Yeah, it's uh, growthacumen, all one word, dot com, dot au. Gotcha. And you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Stephen Norman, and uh, I'm pretty easy to find. I've got a lot of content that we're posting there each week. Yeah. So, just, uh, uh, yeah, please uh, connect and check, check out what we're doing. Yeah. I just uh, linked up with you on LinkedIn just a few seconds ago. Um, oh, awesome. So... You mentioned the changing ways uh, buyers are buying and how that should uh, fuel, I guess, the, some differences in how sales is conducted and how the sales strategy is put together in comparison to yester yesterday. Uh, fill us in on yeah. some of that because I've never really had somebody on the podcast who's dissected that a little bit. Yeah, um, maybe before I go into that, I, I'd just like to, to share a, a couple of other points, right, on, on why the CEOs need to, to focus on the sales function. Yeah, excellent. And I, I, know, I, know, I know you have a lot of founders and startups and, and smaller companies that, that listen to your show. Yeah. And you know, something we have to recognize is what we learned at MBA school 20 years ago about sustainable competitive advantage just doesn't exist in that form anymore. Mm. And uh, we we're all taught you really focus on our SCA and, uh, you know, really invest in our products and maintain differentiation that that'll be key to success. Um, but with most product categories have been heavily commoditized in the last 10 to 20 years and competition's increasing. Uh, we're now faced with a lot more global competition. The world's a lot smaller. You look at our conversation here. Uh, this is very normal now. Mm. Uh, and a lot of us face non-traditional competitors. Um, you know, Microsoft wouldn't have thought that Amazon would be a competitor, right? right? And uh, there, there's all these new types of business models and companies that are competing with us. Mm. So to, to stand out with your product um, is a pretty flawed strategy. Mm. And if we have an advantage, it's not really a sustainable advantage. It may be a transient advantage. We may have an advantage for a short time, but we can't expect to maintain an advantage with our offering. Mm. And so my contention is it's really critical for companies to develop a professional sales function that brings value in and of itself. So where the rubber hits the road, where customers are coming into contact with your company, which is the sales force, they're feeling there's a lot of value there. Yes. Yeah. And how, and do you? So are are you? Uh, you know this this concept of relationships being immensely important. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm also reading a lot about, uh, say, you know, there's a methodology, I think it's called, uh, would be the right term on it, the challenger sale where, you know, you challenge your customer to think differently and so on. Right. Uh, uh, so is the salesperson's job today more than ever to bring value to the conversation, I guess would be maybe what the question is. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right on there. And you know that you, know, you mentioned Challenger, and there's a few other systems yeah. that have a, a similar concept. And uh, of us, you know, customers are not interested in a walk-in brochure, right? Right. So, you know, going back in the past, the value in the company was created by the product team or the development team or marketing created value. And the salesperson job was just to go out and present that the product to the customer and, you know, try and sell it to them. Right. Um, but, but with the circumstances I laid out earlier about, you know, the commoditization and competition, uh, that just doesn't have any impact today. And, and customers have a tremendous information advantage they didn't have before with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the internet and all the di different digital channels. Mm -hmm. They've got access to, to oodles of product information. So when we're interfacing with our customers, we better come with a lot more value than information about our products and our companies. We need to be experts in the customer's world. Mm. And we need to be going to the customers and get comfortable talking about what's happening in their industry, what's happening in their businesses, what other similar businesses are doing that's best practice. And, you know, really, you know, have credibility. And yes. uh, for too long and so many companies are so ingrained on filling their salespeople's heads with product information, company information. You know, we won this award, we won that award, we're opening offices in these different locations or we've got great service. Customers don't care about that anymore. No. No. Yeah, but if you go to customers and start talking about some trends in their industry, you start asking some intelligent questions about their business operations and start getting into the sort of challenges similar companies to them have and do they have those and how are they addressing it, uh, it you've got to make a, make a lot more ground. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so, so imagine an entrepreneur or business owner is listening to this, uh, and they're saying they agree. I can't, I can't imagine them not agreeing. Uh, uh, what is, what are some of the steps that can be taken to mobilize a different approach to sales, uh, such as this? Yeah. So, so there's, there's a couple of, uh, background points on, on, on the change in buying behavior we need to understand when we're sure. starting to design our, our sales force. So, so that's the first thing they should understand yeah. is that buyers have changed. And, and we've sort of indicated a bit, you know, buyers have got access to much more information than before. So let, let, let's accept that. Um, there's another factor now in, in comp company decision-making has become much more complex. Mm. So we see you know, the rise of the buying committee. So in, in the past, in all the old you know, sales um, you know, processes, we're, we're all, all taught to look for the decision maker. The decision maker is very hard to find today. Mm. And uh, generally, they don't, they don't exist. Yes, right. Yeah. Um, and, and all the surveys show that year after year after year, the average size of that buying committee is getting bigger. It, it's up to an average of eight people wow. uh, making commercial decisions. Uh, and at the, the high end, at the enterprise level, like, you know, the, the big banks, the big government departments, it's an average of 17 people. Holy right? smokes. So, 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 we, so we, we better recognize, we better recognize that, that up front, yeah. um, that, that there's some significant changes uh, in, in how buyers behave. And, and I often say buyers have gotten better at buying much faster than sellers have gotten better at selling. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so I'd say, I'd say first, really understanding your industry, what the buying behavior is, mm. and you know, look for some of these factors and recognize some of those factors. 
And, and as I'm talking, maybe some founders are thinking, yeah, I've seen that. That's happening. Okay, what, what do I do? Um, so, so buyers are much more savvy. They're spending less time with suppliers. Because they've got so much information avail- available, they're interfacing with companies and with sales teams much later in their own process. Yes. So, uh, so CEB, the same folks that, that did Challenger, um, identified that buyers are on average 57% of the way through their decision-making process before they make contact with sales. Mm. So uh, we need to be really sharp, very professional, very consultative, very much bringing value from the first contact we have with the customer. Mm. And, um, you know, so, so we've got to, we have to recognize all of those things. And, and uh, we need to be professional. We need to think about the different specialties and the specialist skills to have in our company in a professional sales function. Right. Um, it's, it's not a matter of having three or four or five or ten generalist salespeople who are good at relationships That's right. and have good product information. Right. Um, there are a lot more specialized skills that, that we're going to need in our team. Yeah, ideally, we want dedicated people with those skills who are dedicated to different parts of the sales function. Uh, but realistically, most companies don't have that luxury. Um, so we, we, we do need to have a hybrid model, but we do need to recognize our folks need to have specialized skills, whether it's in prospecting, uh, you know, deal management and managing uh, you know, the bulk of the sale, and then in the customer success and you know, account management skills, you know, once we land a customer, how do we do that most effectively? Mm. Do, you, do you believe uh, sales in today's environment can be taught uh, or is it something that's, uh, you know, you either have it or you don't? Um, no, I, I definitely think it can be taught. Yeah. Um, you know, some people will have a better aptitude for it yeah. than others, and we can test for that. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of great, and I, I cover this in the book. Yeah, you know, selecting the right people and hiring the right people, and having a proper structured process for that is really critical. Um, most of us way overestimate our our ability to select people. Yes. Uh, you know, based on meeting them, based on having a discussion, based on you know looking at their background, um, it can be very deceiving. Yeah, and no. um, especially salespeople. Like it, even if they're not very effective salespeople, they're probably very good at managing an interview. Mm, that's so true. Right? So we're going to be, yeah, yeah. So so we're going to, uh, you know, I really like to test everyone that comes into my organization. You know, I'm looking for some innate characteristics that are strong, things like grit, perseverance, you know, intelligence. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's, got, there's going to be a few factors there. And, and there's a lot of these sales-specific tests that you can do. So you can really see if someone's got the basic characteristics uh, that you're looking for. So once you've got that, I think it's important that the company has its own sales system and its own sales structure and process Mm. that they can bring bring in anybody into. You know, I don't like the idea of just hiring someone who's been successful somewhere else and just throwing them in and letting them do their own thing. Then you end up with a team all doing things differently. There's no process, no structure. It's not manageable. It's not predictable. Yeah, and I guess that's the... the the necessity behind coming up with a predictable uh, process that you can rely on for future, um, you know, target targeting, cash flow, etc. It's a uh, it's so important because uh, and, and you know, sales is really the gatekeeper to success within the organization. Yeah, it absolutely is. And uh, you know, I was speaking with a, a pretty famous entrepreneur over here. Recently, so so this guy, his name's Matt McCullough, and 
he started his third AI company and he's got very deep, you know, 30 years experience in the AI field. Um, already taken two companies to market very successfully on his third one. And so he's a very deep tech person. Mm. But he said to me the key to his success in starting up and being able to, you know, get these companies, you know, to a pretty decent scale and then selling them off um, was developing his sales function. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's not enough to have a better mousetrap. Right. So, so many, so many companies with better mousetraps uh, just just never get anywhere because yeah. you know that they haven't scaled it. Yeah, maybe they get a few sales based on the the founders' charisma or some early adopters that love that technology. Um, but if you're going to have a meaningful business, you better have a meaningful and professional sales function and process. Yeah, and at what stage do you? So you have maybe people listening now that are uh, in their uh, product de- well I mean they're always in product development mode but they have their idea uh, they maybe have got uh, a couple of initial customers based exactly on what you said based on their charisma the idea to get the, the ability to get out yep. to friends who are business owners who might want to buy it and uh, etc et where when when is the right time to begin looking at this sales process and uh, and mapping it out and, and trying to pivot towards something big Look, I, I think you, you can't do it soon enough. Right. You know, uh, I actually had a strategy session um, with uh, a new client of mine last week, and uh, they have some uh, software for the insurance industry. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they've only got their first couple of clients, so, so quite similar to, to your situation. Mm-hmm. And it, it's really important. They don't have much resources. All right. They don't have much money to waste. Um, you know, they've developed a great product. They've got a couple of good clients. And then when we look at the insurance industry uh, over in this region, uh, there's literally thousands of different of companies, of insurance companies of all different sizes in all different parts of the market, right. in all different stages of maturity and so forth, right? Um, so it's really important that we... we we start talking about our sales approach and strategy because we could really burn um, a lot of energy and a lot of our money um, just talking to anyone and everyone or just like taking business that comes to us that maybe not really fit our solution. Um, I don't know if you've seen that. I've seen that happen many times where small companies are a bit desperate. So they end up doing things that aren't natural or in their core. And after a couple of years, they realize they've got yeah, 10 customers with all different types of solutions. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's not going to scale. No. So, so this company has been very smart <coughs> and we've narrowed down that universe. We've actually just narrowed it down out of like 500 potential targets. We've narrowed it down to 30. Wow. Right. We narrowed it down to 30 accounts and we have a, a very deliberate strategy of targeting those 30 accounts with very customized messaging. Mm. And we hope to get 15 to 20 meetings from those accounts. Right. And then we hope to get five to seven or eight opportunities. Yes. And if we can close two or three more deals in the next year, we're happy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then maybe the next year, if we could close five more and then 10, right? So uh, I think it's important from the beginning to you know, narrow your universe, really understand who you serve, and then your sales strategy comes out of that, and your sales process will come out of that. Right. And and it, um, I don't know if I answered that well. No, you that, answered that, extremely well. And and I uh, and I must admit, I uh, so one of the things we haven't talked about. Uh, I don't even think I've ever talked about it on the, on my show. I'm a co-founder of a. Uh, of a six month old company called Dockridge. Um, and mm. my, my two co-founders are highly technical individuals who have built out the enterprise architecture function of uh, numerous uh, government organizations. And we have formed this company and we are building, um, we are building with a client and retaining the intellectual property 
a product uh, for enterprise architecture, forms, um, approval processes, and so on. And um, oh, okay. Yeah, we are right at the right at the, uh, and I'm the salesperson within the uh, within the threesome. And uh, yes. And I, so I'm I'm actually asking the question, and in my mind, because we're right at the point where we got to make some decisions around targeting, uh, messaging. Uh, and so on, right? So I'm, I'm asking the question and thinking through your answer because I, it's very relevant to me right now. Yeah, well, you're talking about a very competitive field, yeah. you know, and no doubt you've got some angle or some differentiation or that there's something those guys have come up with that has specific value to, has a high value to some specific types of customers. Right. And uh, I really encourage you to, like, to narrow down again, you don't have much resources. You can't service too many customers. No, you can't waste your sales resource. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you better focus it on the the lowest hanging fruit and really hone your messaging towards that. And uh, I know you know how to do that because I, I I've heard you before. So I think you yeah. won't have any trouble. Yeah. Well. Yeah, it's interesting because you know working with organizations in a consulting capacity is different than doing it yourself. If that makes any sense, uh, so uh, you know the tendency. Oh yeah. <laughs> the, tendency is, the tendency is to go um, go broad. Uh, you know, it's kind of a natural human tendency, and and we need to be more disciplined. Uh, you know, to get focused and uh, and like you said, very customized in our messaging. Uh, I, I really, I really. No, we know that. And like I said at the start, in, in my own experience, when I started this, even though I've got a lot of experience in targeting and I, and I know it well, when I started this business, I did start off a bit broad. Right. And um, and I, I was sort of struggling because I was picking up different assignments and different projects. Um, you know, to do like a market entry here and help someone with funding and help someone like write an IM and then someone wanted sales training and I am sort of started creating all this content for one-off things and it just wasn't going to scale. Right. It didn't make any sense and I wasn't establishing myself as a leader in in a field and, you know, with, again, with, with you know, the, the digital explosion, um, when customers are looking for a solution, they want a specialist. Mm. They don't want a generalist and they're not attracted by a generalist anymore. So, you know, if you're doing, you know, highly secure document management for, you know, local council drafting offices, right? right. As specific as that, well, you know, you, you could really stake out, you know, that, that leadership position in that segment and have you know, no one come near you. Exactly. Um, and, and there's probably more than enough business in that segment to keep you going for two or three years before you branch into something else. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's fabulous advice uh, and very relevant, I'm sure, to everybody listening. Um, in terms of the seven steps to rise above the chaos, and I'm sure we're touching on elements of those seven steps. as Yeah. Well. Uh, is it in our, in our time left, is it worth uh, touching on those seven steps? Yeah, sure. So, so we, we covered we covered a few. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, first is you know to implement the right sales structure mm. for your business, right? So uh, there, there's a couple of aspects to that. You know, first we have to understand what our company's goals are, right? So if it's a startup situation, if it's a, an established business. And we're going to have a certain focus on existing customers. You know, how much headroom is there with our existing customers? How do we want to resource that versus going after new customers? So, so that's part of uh, the structure discussion. Um, and then it is really understanding the specialized roles and the functions you're going to need in there. So there, there, there's quite a lot around that. Um, the second step is about recruiting and promoting the right talent. So again, we, we touched on that a little bit. You know, we shouldn't be hiring from gut feel. We shouldn't be hiring based on doing unstructured interviews and even having a few people do unstructured interviews. And then we get together and compare notes. And because everyone interviews in a different way, in a different style, we can't get anything, any meaningful comparison when we have that discussion. So 
Uh, I've got a whole framework for hiring more effectively. And it's just a, if, if that's the only thing you do with your sales team, you're going to get a lot of upside. Even if you keep going with your same old broken processes, uh, old processes, hiring better is going to make a huge difference to your business. Um, step three is uh, develop red hot lead generation capability. Um, so with customers being much harder to reach, much better informed, uh, they just don't respond to the old prospecting methods that we used to do 10, 15 years ago, or even five years ago, or even a year ago. Prospecting is the one area that seems to have a, a half-life that just gets keeps getting shorter, right? It's like what worked six months ago or a year ago is almost out of date. Mm. Um, we, we really need to be very much on the edge with our, our prospecting function. So I've got a lot of tips around what a good prospecting function looks like. Awesome. Um, and then there's the, the really critical part of the sales process that most companies overlook. Like a lot of companies put a lot of effort into prospecting. Then they put a lot of effort. Once they've got customers in their funnel, they put a lot of effort on closing deals. Mm. And what gets overlooked is the middle part of the sale. And this is so critical these days. And we've, we've talked about creating value. Um, you know, we've talked about professional consultative selling. We really need to spend a lot of time with the customer doing a proper discovery, really understanding their status quo. Um, what pain are they suffering? What are the costs of their status quo? Um, what happens if they you know, keep, keep on their current path? We really need to be digging into that very deeply. And again, like I said, be experts in our customers' world um, before we start talking about how good things can be if they use our solution, right? We really need to do, do that first half first. Then there, there has to be a proper way. So, so now we're starting to create value. We're starting to show some gap between if they keep on their current path, um, it's going to have some certain outcomes. Um, but if they come with us, there's going to be much better outcomes. So we're starting to build a business case and create value. And we really need our salespeople to spend time on this part of the sales process and be expert in that. Um, and we won't have a closing problem. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know if you know, but 58% of deals that we work on end up in no decision. And it's, it's re and it's mostly because we don't spend time in this middle part of the sale, really helping the customer build that business case right. and spend enough time here. Uh, if we do this, the closing part becomes very natural. If we just go from prospecting to trying to close, which so many companies, especially quarterly driven public companies, you know, they're just trying to drive, you know, the numbers for the quarter um, and they just go into the closing too quickly and uh, it just pushes the customer away. So, um, and then the next part is leveraging the customer experience and referral selling. Um, so I just think there's so much growth opportunity in companies by focusing on existing customers, doing a great job with them, growing our business very profitably, very efficiently, and leveraging them for referrals. Mm. And we all know that. We all know that logically. We know the numbers stack up. But how many companies really have proper referral programs in place mm. and programs to develop customer advocates? So I really implore everyone to put a big priority on that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. um, then the, the, the next step is to invest in collaboration and stakeholder management. So this is really about the sales function not being able to be successful on its own. Right, so the sales function uh, should be very proactive in managing its relationships with marketing, with production, with the, the product team, finance, operations, and so forth. Um, it, it's surveys have shown that the top performing salespeople have much greater, much larger, much deeper internal networks within their own company. So it's really important 
to be successful, that you have credibility with other functions when you need help on a certain deal or you need a favor for a customer or you need a, some test equipment. If you only have to make one phone call and, and give a one minute explanation, you're going to be much more successful than the salesperson who hasn't built any relationships and asks for a favor. Um, and maybe they're, they're going to be bounced back and asked to produce a business case. Um, so it, you know, internal stakeholder management is really critical. Um, and then the last step is about managing change effectively. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, in companies, around 70% of change efforts end up in failure. And uh, if you're looking at transforming your sales team, changing how your company sells, changing how the other functions work with sales, uh, you better put a serious effort behind that change effort, a very structured, detailed effort where the founder or the CEO, the leader is personally involved in every step of that change and making sure it sticks. So I, I outline a whole structure for business leaders and sales leaders to follow to implement change effectively. So it's a, it's a full, you know, end to end uh, guidebook for uh, for sales and business leaders who will, you know want to up their sales game. Wow, sounds like an outstanding <laughs> piece of work. I I can't wait to read it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, getting some good feedback. Yeah, yeah, you cover a lot of ground there, and uh, it's it sounds like a complete guide. Um, yeah, outstanding. So, uh, any closing thoughts i guess uh maybe maybe any calls to action uh i mean people can find your book i'm assuming on amazon also on the website that you uh, mentioned uh, yep uh, you can buy the book directly on the website it's it's on amazon it's on ibooks it's on uh you know all all the major platforms um you connect with me on linkedin would love to hear uh, what's happening in your business or you have any questions uh be more than happy to get engaged yeah Outstanding. And uh, maybe just repeat your website again and we'll call it a, call it an episode. Absolutely. It's uh, growthacumen.com.au. Outstanding. Stephen, this has been a fabulous uh, episode. Uh, you've brought some uh, significant value uh, to those listening and I, I believe calls to action. Uh, so I appreciate your time. You made it very easy, Chris. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Outstanding. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the It's Time to Sell podcast at chrisspervy.com.